Good morning and welcome to Moments with Melinda. I am your host, Melinda Moulton. And today I have as my guest, Todd Lockwood. Todd, how are you doing? <laughs> Very well, Melinda. I'm so I'm so excited to interview you. I, I've learned a lot about you. I've known you for many, many years, but I have dug deep into your into your life and learned so much about you. Let, let me tell my viewers a little bit about you. Todd sure. Lockwood is a photographer, managing director of Vermont Tesla Owners, a novelist, director of the Herb Lockwood Prize in the Arts, a music producer, and a Renaissance man. Did I miss and a great guy? Did I miss anything? <laughs> I don't know. I think you got the probably the uh, the most important pieces there. Good. So I got the gist of it. Well, thank you. Um, so Todd, let's start at the beginning. Um, can you share a little bit about your childhood and growing up in Lake sure. Boston? Yeah. Thank yeah, you. I grew up in uh, southern. Started in southern New Jersey. I, I was born in Philadelphia, and uh, we lived in Morristown, New, Jer New Jersey, right across the Delaware River from uh, from Philadelphia. And uh, my, uh, I'm one of five kids. Uh, the fifth of us, I, I was number two out of five. The, the the youngest wasn't born until we moved up to the Albany, New York area, which was the next place that we uh, we landed, and. Um, I uh, I was uh, as a as a young child I was um, really fascinated by uh, electrical things that was my focus at that point literally at at you know four or five years old I was just absolutely locked on to anything anything electric and uh, um, and so that my parents. Uh, you know, sort of mildly encouraged that. And um, by the time I got into uh, middle school, I was I was really, really, um, you know, uh, getting way into that stuff. I, I was kind of a basement case. I was going, you know, when the other kids would be out playing after school, I'd be down in my basement workshop uh, inventing things, <laughs> you know, so, uh, you know, so that that that, that those are the, the formative years right there. Well, you know, um, you were inspired early in your life at the age of 15 by photography. Talk to us a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, I actually got into photography in middle school sort of through, uh, I learned the darkroom part of it first. Uh, I didn't have a, I didn't start using a camera until after I knew how to make prints in the darkroom. So that was kind of an interesting angle on it. And um, uh, we had a, um, as many people did, we had a fallout shelter in our the basement, built into the basement of our house. And you know, once the Cuban Missile Crisis sort of blew by, uh, and the and the threat was gone, um, that fallout shelter quickly got appropriated to be my dark room, <laughs> out of my home dark room. So I, um, and then when I got into high school, uh, I went to a, a you know boarding school over in Lake Placid, and uh, I. Uh, uh, in my uh, sophomore year there, I, I started, you know, realizing that I had an aptitude for portraits, uh, photographic portraits. And um, uh, by my um, second year there, I was, you know, doing a lot of the a lot of the portraits for the school yearbook. And um, this was a small school. My my senior class only had 50 people. So we had. Uh, you know, each senior got a full page in the book. So that gave me a lot of real estate <laughs> to work with. And we did an, it was a pretty amazing thing. I, I don't, you know, I didn't, I don't think I realized at the time how revolutionary it was what we were doing, because pretty much, you know, any yearbook you'd pick up would have the same little rectangular uh, images, you know, 20 on a page type of thing. And, um, and we uh, we I really broke that mold. I I photographed all of the seniors in my class in different uh, environments. You know, some in the, some on the school campus, some over you know around the village of Lake Placid, and so on. And uh, and so um, that 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 was the class of '69, and that book has become sort of a an iconic thing over there on the campus. Every year, the yearbook. Uh, people all pull that 69 book out and study it, you know, to kind of get ideas for what they might do, you know, so the, that that legacy uh, has been in play ever since. God, I love that. Well, you do note 
that your high school experience at Norwood School in Lake Placid had a greater influence on your future than your college at the Rochester Institute of Technology. Yeah, yeah. At the time, uh, RIT was the only four-year program in photography in the whole country. Uh, so it was the only choice, really. Uh, there were two-year programs here and there, but um, but uh, as far as a four-year program, that was it. So I went to RIT, and in my probably the second week of my freshman year, my uh, photography professor took me aside. He had he had seen my portfolio from high school, and he took me aside and said, "You know, you're you're probably going to be wasting your time here." <laughs> so. But he said, "I'll tell you what. I, I, I'll, we're gonna. I'm gonna work with you, and we'll we'll set up an independent study for you, so you can really focus on the things that you excel at, and 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 just report into me every couple of weeks, and we'll look at your progress and figure out some cool projects you could be uh, applying yourself to." And uh, so that pretty much described my whole four years there, and um, I, you know, and portraits were the 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 thing I was doing the most of. So, so Todd, what do you think gives you that gift of being able to capture people in a portrait? It has to be something about your, your appeal and your energy and your willingness to allow people to be open with you. What, what do you? Yeah, what? yeah, but yeah, definitely. That's part of it. But you know, this, I think the seed was actually planted um, when I was quite young because my mother was was a, a a very good portrait photographer. Her subjects were only the five of us, our, our, our you know, we five kids. But she, you know, did these beautiful black and white portraits. She never learned the darkroom part of it. She would just have that done at the drugstore, you know. And um, and it was um, her. I have some of those portraits on on my wall in my house now, and they're they're you know they're really amazingly good, you know. So I think a seed was planted there, and so that you know it just felt completely natural for me to to go into that when I got to be. Um, you know, um, a, a teenager. So, um, so that's, that's where, you know, that's where some of the where it came from. Well, yep. Beautiful mother. Well, so now you have an ongoing novel. I don't know if it's still ongoing, but it's called Julie, which is 50 chapters written in 50 consecutive days yeah. on May 25th in 2017. Now, and I love how it starts with you reading Stephen Kiernan's fabulous novel. Yeah. While stuck at, uh, yeah. A J a night, you know, you. <laughs> and and yeah, so that's it's funny that being and I was actually stuck there, and you know, being uh, uh, in that situation sort of you know inspired me to to well, what happened is I wrote I started by writing just about that one experience of being stuck at JFK and reading Stevens' novel, and then um, I posted it the next day on Facebook, and so many people related to it and just thought, wow, this is really cool. You got to keep going here. This is the beginning of something, you know? So, so I started uh, writing a chap, you know, the next day I, I just started writing, you know, and, and, um, and what it was, Ju it's uh, Julia is the title. And, and so I, with Julia, I, I was really combining a, a memoir and, and a novel into one thing. I'm a character in it. It's written in first person, but uh, and many of the situations that are described are real. But um, but Julia, of course, was a fig figment of my imagination. But the line is very very um, difficult to to draw unless you know me personally. Then you'd be able to see through it, you know. But most people are reading it and they're going, "Wow, you know, I can't wait to meet this woman, Julia. She sounds amazing." You know? We get to, how do people how do people get their hands on your book? Well, that one, um, uh, there's a link to it on my. I have a a website that is sort of acts as a portal to all these different activities that I've been involved in, and the Julia link is is on there. Um, I mean, you can go directly to juliathenovel.com and um, that will take you right to it. And you can read it for free on there. There's, you, you can know, read like, it right on, on, online. And it's right so online. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and so also, you know, I started writing this story with this, this Julia character and, um, and I just kept going. I went for 50 straight days 
uh, writing a chapter a day and posting them immediately on Facebook. I later I took them off Facebook and put them on this other platform. It just made sense to do that because they were in reverse order on on my Facebook uh, uh, page, you know, which didn't make much sense. Uh, so it was made it a little more tricky for people to follow the story. Um, but well, now, I found it. I found it today. Yeah, it lives on its own website, and it's an illustrated novel too. As you noticed, I I, I used stock photography and and even some artwork that I found on a you know stock uh, uh, image website uh, that you you know where you can license this stuff. And I so I um, sort of you you know made it a little more interesting by making it illustrated. Have you done a Pekakucha yet at the Flynn? No, I've been asked a couple All of times. All right, well, I think... I th yeah, I know I could do one. The timing just hasn't worked out because of other things going on at the same time. Well, I'm asking you because I would love to hear you. Now, let's move on to talk about Herb Lockwood. And he is your late brother and gifted artist, musician, poet, writer, and woodworker in what is now one of the most notable arts awards in the state of Vermont, the Herb Lockwood Prize in the Arts, named after your brother. Talk to us a little bit about your brother and about this. Award. Yeah, yeah. Herb was the youngest of the five of us. He um, went to Hamilton College, and he ended up following me to Burlington. I was already, I was, I'd already been here for a couple of years, and he um, he came uh, in. He moved to to town in '82 and immediately established himself in the in the music and arts community in in Burlington. I mean, got to know lots of people, you know. He was a character. He would he would um he he rented an apartment in an old, in an old house on North Winiski Avenue and he would he would grab his he was a classically trained guitarist. He could write music for an entire orchestra. He had those skills. He he was a um a, um he was actually a geology major in college, which is kind of laughable because he he minored in 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 music and um, you know the music went way way beyond what he ever did with geology. But anyway, um, so he would uh, he would grab his uh, his guitar case and his guitar and and um, go out the door of his apartment and walk down the street. And, um, you know, you get to another house a few doors down where he didn't he hadn't yet met the people that live there. And he'd just go and randomly knock on their door. And they, you know, if they were home, they'd come to the door and he'd say, hi, I'm I'm Herb. I, I live down the down the street a few doors and um, I um, I'm a I'm a musician. I, I write a lot of music. And uh, would you be interested in hearing some new songs that I just wrote, you know, <laughs> And so, yeah, boom, they invite him in. And next thing you know, there's a concert going on in their living room, you know, with whoever was there as an audience. And uh, and so that's the way he was. You know, he was just a magical uh, figure in the area. Um, he uh, uh, he tragically died in a in a woodwork uh, woodworking shop accident on Pine Street in 87. So he'd only been here five years but by that point, he had well established himself as a real, um, a real, uh, you know, inspirational force in the Burlington art scene, and not just in the music scene, like in all sorts of art. Um, if he went to an art show and saw something he really thought was incredible and could even be going maybe to a higher level, he would track the artist down. And uh, he'd call them up and say, hi, you don't know me, but I, I saw your show and it, it was really impressive. And uh, you have you have huge potential. Um, and and, you know, so he became this this uh, mentor to many, many artists in the area of different varieties. And um, uh, Stephen Kiernan, the, the novelist, actually, um, he and Herb were were best friends from diapers because the Kiernans and the Lockwoods, you know, we were both in the Albany area uh, at the same time. And those two were, you know, they were, uh, they were best pals for, for, you know, from, from, two, from a year old, <laughs> you know, or maybe earlier. Uh, and so, uh, and, and I think her being here had a lot to do with, with, uh, with Stephen moving to Burlington. Um, and uh, so anyway, uh, years after he died, uh, I pulled together a few friends from the arts community and we did a little think tank and, and decided, you know, wouldn't it be cool to like create a, an award 
for artists that are doing the kind of thing that Herb was doing as far as encouraging other people to reach as high as they can. Um, and so um, we, this happened in, uh, um, in 2014, we, we pulled this group together and, and, uh, and later that year, boom, we had the first, uh, the first award was given out. It, it was given to a, a theater director and actor from the Middlebury area who is arguably the most talented stage actor ever to work in Vermont, who's from, who and he's from Vermont. Who is that? Uh, Steve Small. Okay, thank and, you. Uh, he was in many, many productions down there. And, uh, and, he, and he also had a high, he did an after-school program for high schoolers that wanted to get into uh, theater professionally, not just as actors, but as, as directors, as stagehands, as uh uh, you know, music arrangers, you name it, you know, and uh, and many, many um, high schoolers from the Middlebury area over the years have ended up working on Broadway in New York. That's outstanding. And so yeah. the so the Herb Lockwood uh, Award is a yearly award. And that, to my viewers, is how it came about in honor of your beautiful youngest brother. Yep. Yep. So yeah. Yeah. So it's given out once a year. There's no <clears throat> the um, uh, there is a nomination process, but it all happens below the radar. An artist cannot nominate themselves, and they don't even know if they are a nominee. They don't. They're, they don't even know they're being considered for it until uh, one of them gets a telephone call once a year, <laughs> letting them know. You know, and uh, and it's a ten thousand dollar prize, which is really a That's you know. Standing own in, in the state. And um, so that's it's, it's really been great. We've given it out um, 11 times now. Um, Congratulations on that. I, I want to move. I want to move to your dad. Yeah. Your dad, W. Carter Lockwood. And I read a bit about him, but he taught you that the journey is more important than the destination. Talk to me a little bit about it. Yeah. Him. My dad was, my dad had an interesting life. He, um, uh, I mean, probably the best thing he ever did was marrying my mom. You know, she she was a, a extraordinary and came from a really interesting family. And so my dad actually ended up going to work for his father-in-law's company. Um, and my, my mother's father had actually uh, uh, gotten into the paper packaging business with three of his brothers, and it turned into a pretty big big deal. And my, my, my grandfather was sort of the creative behind the scenes engineer guy, you know, um, of the, of the four of these, uh, partners. And, um, uh, one day he was sitting at his desk fold, folding a piece of stationery into, um, you know, sort of origami style and folded it into what became the top of the milk carton. The pitcher pour spout was my grandfather's <laughs> idea. Um, and the the patent is still on Google Patents. You can see it there with his name on it, you know. And uh, I and, love this. And so my dad uh, was in sales for that for the company in the milk carton division at a time when all the dairies were still putting milk in bottles. So my dad had a really interesting challenge on his hands to. Uh, convince these dairy operators who were mostly, you know, back then it was in the six, early 60s, these would have been family owned dairies all over uh, the, the territory was operating in was uh, New York State from Kingston up to up to Messina, and as far west as Syracuse. And, um, and so he, uh, you know, my dad was really good at making friends and at meeting new people and stuff. So he could ingratiate himself to these uh, dairy operators quite quite readily and uh now every uh, time every time i open a milk cart i'm going to think about your your dad yeah. uh, and <laughs> yeah. about your mother too you know the gift right, of the right. so um todd in 2011 you debuted your novel dance of the innocence yes a novel about collective behavior uh talk about what this means and how it is captured in your novel where the future of humanity is on the line yeah yeah, this was an idea that hit me in the shower one morning. Um, I it was I think my third attempt at at writing a novel, and um, and this one really stuck because the the idea was compelling. Um, you know, basically what hit me in the shower was this notion of 
what if um, what if you, you have a city, say, of a, a million people, and what if those people were all moving around in some kind of pattern but didn't realize it? And the only way you could detect it is to view it from way up high in the air, like from a satellite or something, and um, and and then change the time too. It would have to be viewed in a different, you know, not in normal speed. You'd have to uh, uh, speed it up, and then you'd you'd see these magical patterns going on of human behavior where people are moving around in beautiful geometric patterns. Yeah, that, that's an engineer's mind, Todd. That's an engineer's mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that became the sort of the seed that that I worked from, you know, and then I, so I realized, okay, this has got to have something to do with, with, um, he, with collective behavior. And so I started studying collective behavior. I read a few books on the subject, um, you know, obviously honeybees, uh, are, are, are often studied relative to this subject. Um, uh, and, you know, I've eventually made a sort of a connection between the honeybees and uh, Native Americans doing their ghost dances back in the early part of the 20th century. And, um, and then the story really took off. It started, uh, the, the novel really started, uh, getting, interesting to me. I, I just couldn't wait to sit down and write the next chapter or two because it was going in such an interesting direction. Uh, you know, it would make a, it would make a wonderful uh, historical movie. It, you know, I haven't really shopped it around that much, but uh, it, it's really a very visual story and uh, very compelling. Um, so where, where can my viewers find your book? Uh, Dance of the Innocence is uh, available on Amazon. It's okay. been on for for a long time. You know, it, the book it came out in two thousand eleven, so it's it's been out a while. Congratulations! So I want to just touch on uh, you were the founder of the Brottingham Library in Burlington. You were in, you were inspired by the fictional library in the nineteen seventy Richard Brottingham novel, and the library only accepts unpublished works on its shelves. And now the library is in Vancouver, Washington, but this was your brainchild. Talk to us very quickly. Yeah, yeah. So when I was in college, somebody turned me on to Richard Barad again. He was, you know, in his in his heyday at that, you know, in the in the uh, early seventies. Uh, he his best selling book was called Trout Fishing in America, which had nothing to do with trout fishing, um, and uh, he was just a character. He was a, he he wrote uh, ten novels in his lifetime and a bunch of wonderful books of poetry. And the thing that was so cool about his writing was it was incredibly accessible. You know, you didn't have to be a big literary person to appreciate and to, and to enjoy his 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 work. It was very very. Uh, plainly written, but if you dug a little, you realized that it was also genius. You know, he was, and 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 he was a humorist, so it was it was great fun to read. Well, one of those novels uh, was um, provocatively titled "The Abortion," and it was a story about a, a magical library in San Francisco, a little pub, privately financed library that only accepted unpublished books nothing published was allowed in the place and as soon as i read that you know this book came out in 75 or oh no i'm sorry it came out in 71 and i i think i read it for the first time in 75 and i i just took to it i just said oh my god that is the coolest idea somebody's got to build this place you know <laughs> and uh, and so i read it I read them. It was a novel you could read in a weekend. You know, his his novels were short and quick reads. And I so I read it every year for about 15 consecutive years. It had a spot on my shelf, you know, in my living room. And I once a year, I'd pull it off the shelf and read it. And I go, God, that is such a great idea. When is somebody going to do this? Well, finally, it it went from when is somebody going to do it to when am I going to do it, you know? And uh, so I pulled together a group of people in Burlington uh, and, uh, and we, you know, created a, a nonprofit and we just, you know, said, we're going to do this, you know, we're going to open the library in that, in that novel uh -huh. in Burlington, Vermont. And we did. And it, um, it quickly became a national news story and stayed in the news for years i mean it was it was wild just wild and even internationally it was being talked about a lot you know because it had never been done before 
And um, and so I think we had, we, there were over a hundred volunteers in Burlington involved in the place, uh, you know, mostly as volunteer librarians putting in a, you know, a couple hours a week and, you know, it was, and it was fun to be part of it because it was so interesting. People, we did, we had walk-ins who had flown to Burlington from the West coast just to go to the Brodigan library and hang out and dig through the books, you know, uh, so it was truly amazing. Uh, that is amazing. Well, congratulations on another extraordinary project. Let's let's move on to White yeah. Audio, which was a great love of your life. It was a remarkable music recording studio, yep. one of the premier studios in the Northeast. Let's talk about some of the grand total talent, the local talent. Yeah. Kind of oh, yeah. So yeah. and the way I got into the music business was really as a as a songwriter myself. I, I played piano as a kid, hated it because I was playing Mozart and stuff that I didn't relate to because we never pl my parents never played classical music in the house. I didn't know I'd never heard this stuff before. So I kind of lost interest in it. But at 27, when I moved to Vermont, I was I had been in Colorado for a few years right before that. This is, you know, between college and Vermont. Um, I um, moved to uh, the Woodstock area and I was down there, Woodstock, Vermont. I was there for about a year and a half prior to moving to Burlington. And while I was in Woodstock, I took up the piano again at age 27 and was playing like crazy. I just, you know, hours a day, just in t I was so charge to to learn it you know uh i had all the drive that i didn't have when i was 10 doing it you know <laughs> and um so anyway when i got to burlington i started setting up some recording equipment in my living room and uh which ultimately became a business um, and uh called white crow and uh we a lot of local bands recorded there and then later the place moved to a warehouse space down in the pine street neighborhood and became a real a real studio, a big one. And then we had artists coming in from all over the country. Um, and we recorded uh, the, what sort of kicked that off was uh, we recorded uh, the first two major uh, releases for Fish on uh, for uh, Electra Records. And uh, and then a lot of other bands from around the country who were following Fish were following their example uh, you know, they saw, oh, gee, White Crow, we ought to go up and record there too, you know? <laughs> so It was an extraordinary uh, business. I mean, it was just a... Yeah, a uh, we, we did record, you know, I started a small local record label too to capture some of the local music, you know, local bands. When we went to the 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 bigger version of White Crow when we moved down to Pine Street, the, the local bands couldn't afford to record there. It was it was a, you know out of their league. But a way, but the, the the having a record label up here made it a local label made it possible for those local bands to 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 re, to record there without it costing them anything. You know that we'd make the money on selling the the product in stores around here. And so we, st I started a little record company called Burling Town, and um, and we uh, we recorded, uh, I believe it was eight or nine different projects on that uh, on that label. And one of those projects, by the way, was the infamous Bernie Sanders folk album, uh, which you know we recorded in '87 when he was still mayor of Burlington. Um, you, you know, I came up with the idea for the project. I, you know, I we had a staff meeting one day and I said, you know, what, what, what would happen if we brought Bernie in here and had him record his favorite songs? <laughs> what would that be like, you know? And uh, so I wrote him a letter. I didn't know him personally at that point. And um, he, I get a message back from his secretary saying the mayor would like to meet with you, you know, and I uh, went down to City Hall. And and so we, we, we you know, we started kind of figuring out how we were going to do this. I didn't know if he had any musical capabilities at all. You know, it turns out he's not only not musical, he, uh, he, he is, uh, you know, he is uh, helplessly unmusical. I mean, he can't tap his foot to a beat, you know, <laughs> but we worked around that because he's a, he's a great writer and a great public speaker. And that's what we, focused on you know and we have him sort of talking the lyrics rather than singing them sort of bob yeah. dylan style so how do we hear this how do we hear especially now with bernie so yeah 
Awesome. It's uh, it's still on Amazon. Okay. Um, if you just search for uh, Bernie Sanders album on okay, Amazon, perfect. you'll find it. It's it's uh, titled "We Shall Overcome," which of course is the title of one That's of the outstanding. So, there. so we we've gone past our time, but I'm going to keep talking to you because yeah. I have other things I want to ask you. So, how did you get involved in the Tesla world, and what do you think of Elon Musk? Well, when um, uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I, well, I'd gone through a phase. Uh, in the, let's see now, in the 90s and into the early 2000s, I went through a phase where I, I actually uh, bought a Ferrari, something I always wanted. It was a used one, you know, and, and had a lot of fun with it. And then I got a new, slightly newer one after that. And, uh, and then I got involved. These things are always there are always opportunities for me to to socialize, you know, so I got to know other Ferrari owners around the region and we started a club up here. And uh, and when the next thing you know, you know, it, it was getting pretty interesting. So that ran its course. I did that for, you know, probably six or seven years. And then uh, I, I just got away from it for for a while, and uh, and then boom! I see this picture of an electric car that Tesla had come up with. I hadn't even heard of Tesla before, and this was in uh, this would have been in 2012, and uh, and I was just completely blown away. I was like, "That thing's electric!" It was a beautiful sedan, you know, um, a model that they still make that's been updated several times over the years. Uh, and I still have one. Um, and uh, so I started, you know, driving a Tesla and, and, and you know, was a, one of the early pioneers of owning one of those up here because there was no service up here. And it was, you know, it was, it was an inconvenience to own a, a Tesla in Vermont at that point. But those of us that did figured out how to do it in you know um how to get the thing charged properly and so on and um well, so taken off They've yeah taken off. so right so yeah so of course it took off and, and finally you know tesla is one of of about 10 states that have a uh, i'm sorry uh, vermont is one of 10 states that that has a a law that um uh, prevents manufacturers of cars from actually opening dealerships. Like in Vermont, all car dealerships have to be owned by a local franchise of some sort. They can't be GM coming into town and opening their own shop. You know, they, they, they don't allow that. So Tesla, from the beginning, has owned all of their facilities, all of their repair centers, the, the company owns them. They're not independently owned. So, so they've had, it's, they've in each of these 10 States where you have this pro prohibition, they Tesla's had to come up with some sort of creative solution. And the fact that they only make EVs has been usually the, the, the argument, you know, they're, they're, they're helping the environment way more than any other car maker. And that's a, that's a huge benefit, you know, and especially in a state like Vermont that's touting its green energy policies and everything, you know. So so anyway, a deal was worked out in Vermont only a few years ago. It was around the time of COVID. Um, the legislature made a, a change to the motor vehicle statutes to allow Tesla to build a service center up here. And of course, it did open in the old Hannaford's uh, grocery store building uh, over near Lowe's uh, in South Burlington. So it's uh, it's amazing <laughs> to have a service center up here now, especially one that's five minutes from my house. Uh, but uh, but yeah, so uh, and you know, um, I I've been following Elon for so long that I you know he's still a genius to me. He's a genius engineer. Um, you know this political stuff he's getting involved in. It's a little disappointing only because he's taking energy away from the, th the the other things that he does that are so important you know he's he is you know he he's a seriously talented engineer and has done a lot of development that um is in those vehicles also he's a he's he has taught himself uh rocket science he is a he is a rocket 
engineer. You know, the stuff that SpaceX is doing, he's actively involved in the engineering on those rockets, which is just mind blowing, you know, that one guy is doing all this stuff, you know. So he's a, he's a very valuable human being um, to society. I, I, in spite of his foibles, uh, he, he's, you know, but he's, yeah, he's come that, out, yeah, he's come out against his, his trans. He's a genius well. that we need. We really need, and we need to just put a, put up with the, the noise, you know, and Stuff to uh, do, but anyway, so let's move on quick to your portrait photography. Yeah. You, you have captured some of the most iconic Vermonters in a most amazingly brilliant and authentic and masterful way. Uh, and you have you do have a book of photographs of these Vermonters, and I'd love, love to know to tell my viewers where they could find that. The actually that was a um, uh, that little book was was uh, really a uh, a catalog for my first big exhibition, and there are still copies floating around. We never we sold them uh, for a while, but I, you know, uh, that that wasn't. Yeah, that I, I've just been giving them out occasionally to to, to people that uh, you know want to see my work and you know, on paper. But um, one day I will do a true you know coffee table book. But I need like a I, Peter like Peter Miller. I mean, Peter, yeah, exactly. Peter. But I don't think I I don't have enough work yet. I mean, yeah. I have a lot of really high quality images, but not a. It's the quantity is not there yet, and I oh. need probably like a hundred really compelling portraits to oh, I um, look forward to that I do yeah. right now, now I could probably come up with 40 or something you know but well you need to get busy um so I'm just kidding you are one of the busiest <laughs> people I know. so I believe you and I are probably about the same age you might be a couple of years younger but we've seen a lot in our long lives what do you make of the greatest threat to humanity climate change and the future for our children. I know you have a couple of sons and. Oh yeah. You know, I mean, on this. It's, it's, you know, it just blows my mind that there are people that don't see what I see, you know, that, that, that I think it's perfectly normal to have, you know, 120 degrees out in Phoenix, you know, that's uh, what's that going to be five years from now or 10 years from now, you know, it, it's accelerating too. That's the other thing is people don't think of it this way, but it, it's um, it's not just slowly getting worse; it's accelerating. So the difference between now and um, ten years from now is just going to be huge. I was just out in uh, Sonoma for a few weeks. I have a, um, a friend out there, and um, occasionally go out, and I'll you know spend some time there. I've gotten to know that community a little bit. It's a it's a neat it's a nice little uh, community, a little bit smaller than Burlington. And um, th we had three days in a row that were 115 while I was there. Uh, yeah, you know, and everybody's just going about their business. But I'm, you know, thinking, boy, you know, you can't go much higher than that before it it will be really dangerous to go out anywhere, you know, to leave your house. I, yeah. um, I appreciate your advocacy, and I know you're doing a lot. Yeah, yeah. So the, yeah. So the you know, drive, I've been saying for years now, that people that can afford to drive uh, electric and, and have solar on their house have no reason not to do it. You know, it's just, it's so obvious now. And then you've got choices too. And it's not, and electric cars are a lot less expensive than they were even five years ago. A lot further. So, so I'm going to move on now to the, um, to the first woman of Black and Asian heritage running for president. Uh, as someone who has always cared about equality, inclusion, and diversity, how exciting is this moment in America's history? Oh, I think, yeah, it's, yeah, it's really, really amazing. And uh, yeah, yeah, Kamala's, uh, I think was, you know, one of the things I really like about her is, you know, she was a prosecutor, you know, she's not going to be a pushover in in any sort of uh, debate situation, you know, uh, she can hold her own with the best of them. You know? <laughs> so so that's that's pretty cool. Um, and, you know, and she's been part of a, a, a an administration that's done a lot of great things. You know, all this focus on Biden's age is warranted, I think. But um, but it's taking the 
you know, the spotlight off of all the amazing things that that administration has done while, while they've been in there. It's, it's really yeah. something. What a, what a, what a great time in our history. So now I want to talk to you. Uh, we're coming to the close of the show, but I want you to talk to me only if you feel comfortable about your bout with COVID uh, in July and the result. Yeah. Of COVID, yeah. Which might be some important information for folks out there. Yeah. Well, I've been diligently getting my vaccines and my boosters and everything, just like clockwork, you know, it's, and, and, uh, and I've been lucky. I just didn't get, I didn't catch it until uh, just, a, you know, um, a couple months ago. And, uh, and, and it was only about, I don't know, it was like a month after the last uh, booster that I got is when I caught it, which was surprising sort of surprising but 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 that what that meant you know they've said all along you know these boosters and things are not not going to necessarily prevent you from catching it but they will reduce the severity of the symptoms by quite a bit and that was definitely the case this was a this felt like a really mild very very mild case of covid i only had a temperature for half a day and it was 101 or 100 and a half or something like that it wasn't wasn't much of anything and that i was still infectious for two weeks which is pretty typical um, but I felt fine. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't in bed or anything, you know, go on antivirals or not. No, no. no. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I considered it, but the, my doctor didn't think it, that my, my case was serious enough to warrant it, you know? And, uh, however, when I got out to, um, Sonoma about, then that was about six weeks after, uh, getting over, COVID, you know, getting where I wasn't uh, contagious anymore. Um, uh, in the first week out there, uh, my friend and I went to a, a gym and we got on a couple of Peloton bikes and we're pedaling away. And this is, I have a gym in my house and I have a bike in my gym that I use all the time. And um, so this isn't, this was nothing new for me. Um, and so we're pedaling away. I went for about uh, 20 minutes. I, it was a little less than what I usually do. And um uh, and I, you know, got off the bike and I usually track the workouts on my Apple watch. And I looked at the heart rate on my Apple watch and it was, um, it wasn't coming down. You know, I had gotten it up to like uh, 125 and it's, and it, and it sort of stayed there when I got off the bike and stayed there for like 15 minutes, you know, sort of moving around between 120 and 125. And I have a very low resting heart rate. Normally it's, it's, um, it's in the, usually in the forties, actually, if I'm not moving around. Uh, so we went to the hospital in Sonoma, we went to the emergency room, they got me all wired up and they said, you've got AFib. And, and so I, you know, uh, I felt okay. I didn't have any chest pain or anything, but they could see it, you know, on their, on the, on the EKG. And, um, and the, the doctor said to me, he said, you know, um, you'd be surprised how many people we've had come in here since COVID started, um, who recently had COVID and now they have AFib. He said, it's, there's definitely a connection, but it, but the medical community just doesn't fully understand it yet. So when I got back to my friend's house, we I Googled um, COVID and AFib, and boom, it came up with an article by the American Heart Association. It was on their website about a study that was done looking at hospitalized COVID patients that had developed AFib while they were in the hospital. And so there's definitely something going on here. Um, so I'm, I've been, it's been in a, now I'm, you know, I'm wearing a, a heart monitor as we speak here. It just, just, just in case anything happens, I'll have a way of, it'll just get recorded and then they can look and see what it, what it, what, the, what it looked like. Um, but I haven't had anything <laughs> since that initial Fine, you're, you're thing in, uh, in Sonoma. I haven't had any recurrence at all, none. And I've been on my gym bike every other day, pushing away, you know, and uh, nothing. So I might be one of the lucky ones that will only get it once, you know, and that'll be that. Strong. You're strong and you work out. So, well, thank you for that. I mean, I'm, I'm yeah. grateful that you're doing all right. 
Um, so Todd, we're coming to the close of our interview. I could talk to you for days. Um, and I just want to say that you are a man of many talents and a master of even more. Um, it's been a delight and an honor to spend this time with you and share a bit about your life, Todd. And I hope someday I get to have a black and white photograph, portrait photograph taken by Todd Lockwood. It would be a great honor. Well, we'll see if we can make that happen, Melinda. <laughs> I know my husband would love it too. So thank you for being on my show and for being um, such a great, important part of Vermont and uh, for, for providing yourself to so many of us over the years. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. All right. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. Thank you, my viewers. I will see you shortly. Have a great day. Bye-bye.